plants. Plants are uh, interesting in their own right. Um, they have a whole assortment of uh, ways of dealing with the jobs of life. And plants, uh, you know, just like animals, they have cells which specialize and produce tissues and even organs. I don't know if you're aware of that, but we're going to look at some of the tissues and organ systems of plants. They do tend to be a little more simplistic. It's, it's interesting to note that, you know, way back in evolution, there were basically two major options or two choices, one choice that was made, and it was either to become an autotroph, right? In other words, there were animals, or there were cells, I should say, that had uh, chlorophyll and were able to make their own food energy. And then there were, of course, heterotrophic animals, which means that they had to eat other things heterotrophs. And um, these two uh, these two sort of options for for life have taken off into the, the major kingdoms of plants and animals, right? Um, and in, in fact, the heterotrophs also include things like fungus and stuff like that as well. But the autotroph is interesting in the fact that it has chlorophyll and they can make their own food from sunlight. Right? That's kind of one of the major distinctions between plants and other kinds of living organisms. This chlorophyll. But what I was going to say is it's kind of interesting to note that so far, at least, okay, sorry about the interruption. We're probably going to have lots of those today. Um, the uh, interesting thing that, that I've wondered about is, is why autotrophic organisms have never seemed to develop the complexity of animals. And of course, if you look at humans and other animals that are able to do some pretty impressive things, we don't see that happening in the plant world. We don't see much beyond, you know, trees and plants that are relatively complex, but they're not building bridges. And so one makes you wonder if that has something to do with the limitations of getting energy from the sun and chlorophyll. Perhaps it's just not feasible to get enough energy that way to be able to develop or evolve into something that can do things like we can. So heterotrophs obviously have the advantage, perhaps, in terms of energy. But if you're a tree and you're living and you're doing your thing, I suppose they don't seem to care. So let's talk about the plant cell um, to start off and see some of the differences. Uh, in grade 10, you would have learned about plant cells. Right? I've got a picture here. Sort of, oh, I had one loaded up. Here it is. Um, this picture right here uh, is a typical plant cell. I don't know if I can get that to be larger. Let's see what happens if I go back to my pointer and uh, try and get that to load up. It's probably going to be a website and it may not be a bigger picture. Let's see. Overview, see where is it? Parts of a plant cell. Let's see if it's any bigger. There it is. A little bit bigger. So you can see it has most of the same, um, most of the same things we find in animal cells, but there are some key differences. Right? The key differences, of course, are the existence of the cell wall. I'm going to go back to my um, my pen here. Maybe in red. The cell wall, which is uh, composed mostly of cellulose, which is a kind of polysaccharide. It's a kind of, uh, of starch, essentially. And uh, remember, cellulose is that starch that our bodies can't digest, and it turns into fiber, or it is fiber, in our digestive system. So if you're studying for your digestive system quiz, that's where fiber comes from. Uh, the cell wall is one thing. The other thing you'll notice is that because the cell wall is rigid, right, it, it's, it's got like a, a hardness to it, it creates more of a, of a shape to the cell, whereas animal cells tend to be sort of all different shapes. Plant cells tend to be kind of almost brick-like in their nature. And that's because the cell walls give them a rigidity which allows them to stack together and make structures that can withstand enormous forces, like stems plants or flowers, but even a tree. If you think about the, the wood of a tree, that's made of cells. And those cells are incredibly strong. Um, the forces a tree undergoes in, the, in a bad storm, in a windstorm, if you think about how much wind is blowing on those trees, the forces are immense. 
And so the cell wall is actually a marvel of biological engineering, isn't it? When you think about the fact that Mother Nature has found a way to make a tree that can withstand such immense forces. Um, it has the Golgi apparatus, it has the, uh, the nucleus, of course, the nucleolus, the endoplasmic reticulum, all the same things we find with the animal cells. Uh, mitochondria. Uh, what's interesting is people, when they start learning about plants, they, they assume that because a plant is an autotroph and gets its energy from sunlight, that it, it doesn't have any respiration going on. But it does. It does both. The difference between plants and animals is animals only respire. They only use... Uh, food energy in the mitochondria to produce the ATP they need to live. But plants do both. They make their own sugars, and then they use those sugars, just like an animal cell would. They just don't need as much energy. So we might not see as many mitochondria in a plant cell. Uh, what else is interesting about the plant cell? The lack of centrioles. Centrioles are two little sort of organelles in animal cells that are related to... Um, cell division. They have a role to play. They migrate to the ends of the cells and they form sort of uh, anchors for the uh, spindle fibers that pull cells apart in mitosis, as you'll recall from Credo uh, 10. But uh, plants seem to lack those particular organelles. All right. Uh, now, this is a diagrammatic version. There's also, if I can go back to my pointer, there's also... Um, let me go back here. Oops. Nope. Back. Nope. Get rid of that. Go back to my search. Yeah. There's some, some pictures here that are a little bit more sort of 3D-ish. Um, like this one. Uh, this one's not so good. Let's see if I can find... Well, at least they're all sort of the same. This one isn't too bad. It's a little clearer to see this one. And you can see the 3D nature of the cell. We often forget that when we're drawing on the flat surface. Okay, so let's go back to here. Plant cells. Um, they have uh, the cell wall. is one of the distinguishing features. Uh, cell wall, distinguishing feature. The other thing I, I didn't mention is if you look at the cells, especially that one we were looking at before, I can't get to it right now, hang on a second. Um, this one. You'll notice in the picture the very large light blue colored vacuole. It's, it's quite big. It takes up a lot of the space of the cell. And the vacuole is a, a huge sort of membrane-bound organ that contains essentially water or fluid. And the vacuole of plants has a very important role in... Um, controlling the amount of pressure inside a plant cell. It's called turgor pressure. And turgor pressure is very important uh, also in allowing the plant to maintain its structural integrity. So think about a rubber tire. It's soft and flexible when it's empty, but when you fill it full of air, it becomes extremely hard and durable, and it can support the weight of an entire car. And this is the same idea uh, here. Um, <clears throat> the large vacuoles that we find in plant cells. Both of these things work together to provide the structure of plants. When a plant has lots of water, it becomes thick and uh, rigid and, and, and the uh, vacuoles fill and swell inside the cells. But if a plant is dehydrated, the vacuoles shrink and the plant begins to wilt and it loses its ability to stand up straight. So it loses its structural support. So the large vacuoles in the cell wall are two important structures that we find in plant cells that allow them to function the way they do. All right. Now plant cells also specialize. They specialize into plant tissues. Just like with humans and animals. So let's have a look at some of the possible plant tissues that we could find. All right, so there are basically three kinds of plant tissue. There's what we call dermal tissue. Now, if you think about the word dermal, uh, dermal tissue, dermal refers to skins and things like this. So dermal tissue produces 
epidermis or epidermal cells. Um, essentially, skins. I'll put skins in quotes because obviously it's not like human skin, but it's any kind of layer, a layered skin-like structure. Okay. Then we have something called um, ground tissue. So we'll put a line here. Ground tissue. And ground tissue includes things like um, photosynthesis cells. So obviously in plants, the vast, a, a, a very important thing is photosynthesis, and a lot of these cells in plants are specialized to take care of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis cells. A lot of the cells, though they may have chlorophyll and may still be green, they, their role is not so much to photosynthesize. So their role becomes something else. The other kind of uh, structure that we find here um, are support cells and structural support cells. In other words, cells that have thick cell walls, uh, thick and hard cell walls. Maybe we can just put that in there beside their thick cell walls. And then the last kind of tissue is um, we call vascular tissue. Plants do have uh, veins. Vascular tissue. And that is basically two kinds of vessels that transport things. And they're called the xylem. Xylem tissue. Xylem tissue is, is uh, basically for the transport of water. Transports water. And of course, dissolved in that water is also minerals. things uh, typically that the plant absorbs through its roots from the soil, right? The only real place a plant can grab things it needs for building blocks is through the soil. So it will absorb minerals that it needs through the soil and transport them in the water through the xylem tissue. And then la the other one is the phloem tissue, the xylem and phloem. You've got to get used to those. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to cover that last year with all the short, uh, shortened uh, term and everything, but phloem cells um, are essentially for uh, transport of sugar. The sugars that are made by photosynthesis are transported in the phloem cells. Uh, what's interesting about the phloem is they are living cells. They're alive, doing their thing. And part of the reason for that is because the transport of sugar involves some active transport and so on. But xylem is actually dead. The xylem cells are so highly specialized, they actually stop being alive. They form as living cells, and then they specialize into um, sort of a tube-like structure and they use their cell walls, essentially, as the skeletal structures to build tubes. And then they, they die, and they, their contents empties out. And they become nothing but a basic tube or a pipe traveling through the, uh, the plant. So that's an extreme form of cell specialization. Uh, wood, what we typically think of as wood, that we burn in fireplaces and things, is primarily just dead xylem tissue. That's what we call wood. And we'll talk more about um, how that works a little bit later on. Okay, so um, vascular tissue. Good. Let's now, those are the different tissues. Let's look at some of the possible ways that these tissues could form organs. 
All right, so we have dermal tissue, which forms linings and skins, just like in humans, our dermal, there's a tissue that forms uh, our skins and things, right? And then we have this ground tissue, which we'll see, and then we have the xylem and phloem. So let's draw a picture of one of the most important organs of a flower, how all these tissues get together. Remember that an organ is when tissues organize themselves to perform a job. So the organ, what we're going to do first is the leaf. The leaf is a plant organ, and it's uh, designed primarily for the purpose of photosynthesizing, right? That's what leaves do. They stick out on the top of the plant, and they gather light for energy. So, let's see what a leaf looks like. We're going to draw a nice picture now. Are we all caught up? Okay, so I'm going to give us some space here. I'll take a nice green color. Maybe uh, if I can... Maybe I can uh, look for some different shades of green. I'll do this dark green color here. Maybe a light green instead. Okay, so I'll do this light green color. There we go. Gotcha. I don't know what happened there. I'm trying to just do my color here. Why won't that go away? Okay, so uh, we have a, a, a line of cells. I'm going to draw them in this light green color, sort of like this, across the top. You'll need about a half a page or so to, to get this entire picture in. And these cells are um, forming this layer. We'll put a little nucleus inside. And they look more like cells. Maybe we'll get a little crayon here. And we'll color them in. Lightly. There. So this particular uh, kind of cell is Called, it's a dermal tissue, and it's called the epidermal layer. So it's a skin on the top of the leaf. So what we're drawing here is a leaf in cross-section. All right, so uh, the skin, or the dermal layer. So this is called the epidermal, uh, or epidermis. We could call it epidermis. And uh, like I was saying before, um, the, this is the cross section of a leaf, so it's kind of like if a leaf is a piece of paper, we're looking at it sort of edge on under the microscope to see what this edge looks like. We cut the leaf open to see what happens. Okay, underneath this, we'll get a different color. Um, perhaps uh, we'll use this middle green color here. And we're going to draw uh, a bunch of cells that are sort of oriented in a different direction. They're oriented more up and down, and they go all the way across. This kind of structure, or this kind of orientation, was often used to build forts out of big logs. They stick them all up. You'll remember if you've seen any old movies or pictures of old forts and things. And uh, this is called a palisade. That's the name of it. Um, some communities where people live, they build fences like this palisade fences. And uh, it's not a word we use very often, but so these are also cells. This is called the palisade layer. So let's call it the palisade. Uh, one or two L's. Uh, one L, palisade layer. And I'm going to color these guys in as well. We'll shade them in in that middle, middle green color. These cells are the primary photosynthesizing cells. This is where photosynthesis is happening big time. All right. Then what happens is we get this layer that is, it's called the spongy 
mesophyll, and it doesn't have cells all the way through it. It has open spaces like a sponge. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw, you know, a, whoops, we're going to get our um, crayon back. Ah, oh, crap. We're going to get our pen back here, uh, same color, and we're going to fix these guys up. And we're going to draw sort of um, a little clump of cells sort of here like this. Okay. Then we're going to draw another sort of clump down here like this. One, two. We're going to leave a space here in the middle because we have to draw something else there. So then we'll go over here and we can draw one, two, three, four. And then maybe over here, one, two, three, four, five, something like that. We'll put a nucleus in these cells as well. Now these cells are green and they do contain chlorophyll and they can photosynthesize, but their main role is to, is to provide sort of a, a spongy anchoring system that, that keeps this whole area sort of... Uh, think about a, uh, an internal skeletal framework, right, with lots of air spaces in between it. Let's color them in. Crayon. I don't know which color I want. Same color, yeah. Okay. And then this whole region is going to be called the, the mesophyll or the, the mesophyll layer. So what we'll do is we'll put a little label here. Now, some books that I've seen will include the palisade layer in the mesophyll. Uh, some of them don't, um, but I'm going to just draw it like this, the mesophyll. Now, it's sometimes called the spongy mesophyll to remind us that it's got a spongy uh, airspace uh, all through it. Then we have on the bottom... I'm going to move up a bit just so I can get to the bottom here. I'm going to go back to that original color of green that I had. And I'm going to draw another layer of epidermal cells. But I'm going to do something different. I'm going to leave a space right here. Okay? Like this. And another space sort of over there. Well, that looks silly. We don't really need that guy. He's kind of sticking out. One space will work just for the purposes that we have. Um, maybe I can draw. Oh, what happened there? Oof. Okay. I just wanted to draw one more little cell over here. There we go. And the nucleus inside. And then we're going to color them in. But I'm going to color them a little bit differently just to show something very important. I'm going to take the, um, the dark green color and I'm going to shade this guy and this guy in dark green. Just so they stand out. Okay? And then I'm going to shade the rest of them in this light green color. So this is another epidermal layer. It's an epidermis. And of course, it's the bottom of the leaf. It's the skin at the bottom. So, uh, black, and then we have uh, another epidermal layer, or epidermis. Sometimes it's called the upper and the lower. Okay, one more thing, well, a couple more things to draw. Uh, we're going to take sort of a, a brownish color. Maybe I'll use the crayon for this, because it'll look better. And uh, we'll get the nice sort of light brown color. This color should work. And I'm going to draw, I'm going to just shade across the top like this. In a sort of a line, back and forth, darken it up a bit. And also along the bottom, but 
not where the hole is. Like this. This that I'm drawing here isn't actually cells. It's a substance that's secreted by the epidermal cells. It's wax. And what it does is it waterproofs and protects the cell. So we call this a cuticle. Let me just go back to my pen. Sometimes it's called the waxy cuticle because it's made of wax. But we'll just call it the cuticle for now. I'll put an arrow so we know what we're, we're talking about. And there's one on the bottom and there's one on the top. Uh, plants have enemies. Insects like to eat them, chew on them. The waxy cuticle can help prevent or at least slow insects down. It can make the leaf harder to, to, uh, to chew through. But more importantly, it also waterproofs the leaf so that fluid isn't lost. Uh, managing water loss, just, for, just like with animals, when we have to think about losing water, for plants it's the same. Tons of uh, water is moving through plants all the time, and we need to be careful that we don't lose too much of it. Okay, we're almost done the picture, but we have to draw one more thing. Um, and so, uh, uh, actually, I'm also going to label something else here. Hang on a second. Um, in the mesophyll, I'm going to I'm going to label this as uh, parenchyma cells. That's what these are called. So I'll put that in brackets. The parenchyma. Um, yeah, parenchyma cells. So they have a different function. They're, they're for structural support more than anything. Uh, okay, so now we're going to draw this. We're going to take uh, some other colors here. Maybe I'm going to take this um, sort of something brown, maybe this light brown color here. And that, okay. And right in the middle, we're going to draw a circular sort of shape. We're going to draw little tiny cells like this that make like a circle. And go all around like little bricks. And there's a couple of layers of them. These are called bundle sheath cells, actually. Uh, and, and what they do is they make this tubular structure. Okay, I'll get my crayon. And I'll color them all in. And, of course, they have a nucleus as well, but I can't really get... I can't get a nucleus to uh, appear in each... Well, maybe if I do this, I can. There we go, nuclei all over the place. And this, of course, forms the structure of the vein that runs through a leaf. So this is the vascular tissue, right? And then inside, I'm going to use two different colors. Uh, I'll use a reddish color or a purpley color. Let's use, um, let's use purple. It'll stand out. And in purple, I'm going to have a series of cells like this, sort of on the top section. I'll put a nucleus in these cells because they're alive. And what they are are the phloem. Oh, actually, wait a minute. Maybe the xylem is on top. I think it doesn't really matter. The structure is different. So I'm going to erase those nuclei. My mistake. My mistake. We'll put the xylem on top. So these are the purple xylem. There we go. Xylem. So no nuclei because remember the xylem cells are dead. They've given up. They're basically just tubes now. And that's cut through them. So you're looking at the edge on tubes. And then uh, down below we'll draw in, in this other color. Maybe we'll use red to distinguish. Uh, no, we'll use blue I think. It'll stick out better. 
And uh, down here we have the phloem cells. These are the ones I meant to put nuclei in. But, okay. So what I'll do is I'll write over here in uh, the appropriate colors. Uh, hang on, let me get the right color. The purple color are the xylem cells, right? And we can put a little arrow in there. And the blue color are the phloem cells. The arrangement of the, the xylem and phloem um, varies from species to species and plant to plant and whatnot, but basically they're both in there. That's what we have to remember. So there's what a leaf kind of looks like under a microscope in cross-section. And these are all the parts of it. Um, the entire vascular structure. Uh, I didn't label the bundle sheath cells. Uh, that's something you'll learn about later uh, next year. Uh, they have a role to play in certain plants in the way that they do photosynthesis. But basically, they're just the cells around the outside. They're the brownie colored ones that form the sheath of the bundle, the vascular bundle, which contains all the different vessels that are traveling through. So remember, this is a vein through a leaf and it's traveling in and out of the board through, through the leaf because we've cut it in half. So what we can see here are all the different tissues represented, right? We can see that there is uh, dermal tissue represented in the top and the bottom by the epidermis. We can see that there are photosynthetic um, ground tissue in the palisade layer. Um, and we can also see that there's uh, uh, vascular tissue in the xylem and the phloem. So they're all working together to produce a leaf. What we didn't label is what the little hole is at the bottom. The leaf has a hole at the bottom because uh, it has to allow air in. So the hole is called um, a stomate. A stomate or a stoma, sometimes they'll call it a stoma, um, and many of them are called stomata. That's what this little hole is here. And then on either side of the hole, remember how I colored these two cells a different color? These two cells are called guard cells because they control the hole. The hole can actually open and close. And what happens here is if I take uh, a dotted line and maybe change the color to, uh, what's the color I'm not using very much of here? I'll take this purple color. Uh, what has to happen here is fresh air that contains carbon dioxide. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, thin line like this. So what we have is we have the movement of air going into this place here and the air is carbon dioxide, the gas that the plant is trying to get in. Because remember in photosynthesis it's the opposite of respiration. You're using CO2 plus water, right? And you're using that to manufacture sugars. The other thing that has to happen is oxygen has to come out. So I'll get another color for that. Maybe this uh, color did I use? Maybe I'll use this purple color. And uh, okay, is that going to work? Purple thickness. Okay, so what's coming out here? is oxygen. It's a waste product for these cells. So the space in between, which I, I haven't colored, it's all white, where those arrows are coming and going, that's the air. This is how a plant breathes. The respiration of a plant is just as important as it is for humans. Air has to move in and out of the plant. It does so primarily by diffusion. It doesn't have to be pushed or forced. So plants don't need muscles like the diaphragm or lungs. 
they just have to have an open space. And as carbon dioxide is used up in, inside the plant to become sugar, the concentration goes down. So outside there's more and inside there's less and so it tends to come in. But as the photosynthesis proceeds and it, the plant makes more and more oxygen, the oxygen is building up inside and there's less outside so it tends to go out, follows diffusion. So this is the air exchange. But there's a big problem with this system of air exchange. It is kind of the same problem humans have. Whenever we breathe out, not only do we breathe out air, carbon dioxide and whatnot, but we also breathe out quite a bit of water. Our, air, our breath is very moist. And that water is useful. We don't really want to waste it. And it's the same problem with the plant. Water can also move through these holes. And typically, because inside of a plant you're using up water, Remember? I'm going to draw the, uh, just so to remind you, I'm going to go underneath here and draw the equation for photosynthesis, which is sort of the backwards version of the energy equation for respiration, right? We're taking carbon dioxide out of the air. We're combining it. There'd be six of them. We're combining it with water molecules. And we are producing C6H12O6, glucose, and oxygen gas, 6O2s. The only difference is, is that this reaction doesn't happen automatically. It requires sort of the, the help of the green pigment chlorophyll. So we often write chlorophyll here on top as a sort of a necessary component of this. In other words, what we say is this reaction won't happen unless it's pushed. It's a reaction that, that doesn't just happen automatically. Um, you'll learn more about that next year. It's a non-spontaneous reaction. And in chemistry, you might learn that. And so what that means is it needs a constant push to, to make it work. And the constant push is the sunlight energy that's beating down and captured by the chlorophyll to give it the push it needs to work. So if you look at this, what you can see are the products. We're making oxygen but we're using up water. So plants need water to make glucose. So inside the plant, if, if photosynthesis is happening in, that, in, that, in the parenchyma cells, the palisade layer, then what's happening is a lot of the water is being used. And the plant has to suck up more water from the roots to keep replenishing that through the xylem tissue. You don't want that water to be going out through the stomates, if possible. You want to save it. So let's talk about how the, the stomate functions to control gases. Um, okay, but let's, let's do a little bit of, a, of a, a, a sort of a little list to remind us. So underneath your picture, I'm not going to write all of this because I want to train you to also listen and write. So basically, let's write down epidermis and describe in a sentence or two what it's doing. The epidermis forms the upper and lower skin of the leaf. And so essentially, it's forming the structural sort of skins that hold everything together. So write something to that effect down. So you might mention that it's also made of dermal tissue but it's pretty epidermis that kind of gives it away. The other thing it does, of course, is it secretes the waxy cuticle that helps you protect and waterproof the leaf. So that would be another important thing, the waxy cuticle on top and the bottom to protect and to waterproof the leaf. The palisade layer, write down palisade layer. And, of course, the palisade layer is the primary photosynthetic cells of the leaf. This is where the photosynthesis action is happening for the most part in the palisade layer. Then we have the parenchyma cells in the mesophyll. The parenchyma cells, uh, although they can photosynthesize, primarily their job is to create sort of a structural network of support. Now, it's hard in the cross-section to show how this would work. It almost looks like in my picture that they're not touching, right? But some of these, some of these things would touch. So I'm going to go back to the picture here in this green color. 
Uh, what color was it? It was the dark. Yeah, it was that color. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to adjust it. I'm going to draw a couple more of these cells right here, right like that, touching to show that these form like supports, like arches and, and uh, structures throughout here. But there's all kinds of air spaces in between. So let's just do that real quick. Uh, dark. No, nope, not that dark. Must have been this color. There. Just those two cells give us, you can see how it supports and connects the top and the bottom. But it's all sort of networked um, inside there. And it, it creates these air spaces inside the cell, which are critical for the cell to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. So that's what we would write there. It's very important for water or for oxygen and carbon dioxide to be able to move in and out of the leaf and get to where the photosynthesis is happening or to leave, depending on whether it's a waste or not. And you might also add that both the palisade and the parenchyma cells are a form of ground tissue. So just, just remember the different tissues that are being used. Okay, let's write down the vascular bundle, which is the nice colorful part in the middle, which contains the bundle sheath cells, the xylem cells, and the phloem cells. And of course, the purpose of the xylem, I think I actually rewrote that uh, under tissues, is to transport water, and the phloem cells are for transporting sugars, essentially in and out of the cell, and they are the, this is the circulatory system of the cell, except, uh, or of the, of the plant, except that the plant doesn't need a heart to pump its fluids around. Its fluids are moved around by, by uh, something called turgor pressure and water pressure and varying amounts of concentrations of things. So it's all sort of concentration gradient based rather than using a heart or any kind of organ to push or pump. Uh, osmosis is also part of that process. Okay? All right, and all of this talk about photosynthesis kind of makes me think about way back when we were talking about plant cells and how they're different. Um, I, I didn't get into this because I kind of assumed it, but it's also important to remember that, of course, plant cells do have that chlorophyll, which animal cells don't. Um, so maybe we should go back up here and just maybe in green I'll remind us remind us that chlorophyll, I kind of expected you to know that already, but um, I, I highlighted these two because there's, there are two things that we often forget about. We just think about the chlorophyll part. But of course, chlorophyll is a very important key component. It's a molecule that can trap sunlight energy, right, or capture it. Okay, now the only thing we haven't talked about is the bottom part here, the stomates and the guard cells. So I'm just going to talk about that and I'll draw you some pictures. So the uh, stomates, these are basically openings in the lower epidermis. Why do you think it's in the lower epidermis instead of the upper epidermis? Uh, okay, first of all, to allow gas exchange. Allow gas exchange. And by gas exchange, we mean CO2 in and O2 out, right? If you think about how a leaf is oriented, the top is capturing sunlight. The sun is beating down on the top. It gets quite warm, whereas the bottom is sheltered. It's in the shade of the, tr of the leaf. And so if you have holes on the top, that hot sun is going to evaporate water much quicker. So remember we said water loss through the stomates is a problem for the plant. It doesn't want that to happen. And so having the holes on the bottom minimizes the amount of uh, evaporation. Now the guard cells, the two specialized epidermal cells that work on the out, are on the outside, the guard cells open and close the stomates. Now, how they do that requires a little picture. Essentially, the guard cells um, are attached end to end, kind of like sausage links. 
So the two guard cells are sort of attached like two sausages, something like this. And essentially, when there's lots of water, when H2O is abundant and the plant is not worried, abundant, let's spell that right, The stomates can be open. That's not a problem, right? Losing water when there's lots of water isn't, it, isn't an issue. So the stomates can be open. And what happens is, it just so happens that when there's lots of water, the water fills the guard cells full. And as, uh, as full guard cells, they build up uh, trigger pressure. Lots of water means trigger pressure which is basically pressure inside the cell because of all this water. And the pressure bulges the cells open, creating a space in between because they're attached at the top and the bottom. And the stomate then is the space that opens in between. But of course, if the plant is getting low on water, it doesn't want the stomates open because that's where water is being lost. And so what, the, what happens when water is not abundant, when water is scarce, let's write this in a different color, the plant is becoming dehydrated, it wants to save water. The stomates will close to prevent water loss. And the reason they close is because as water leaves uh, the guard cells, they, they get less rigid and they become all floppy. And when the two sausages get less rigid and become all floppy, they tend to flop together like this and they tend to close the stomate. I'll put some nuclei here in our guard cells to remember that they're cells. So this, we have, we have, I'm going to put more trigger pressure up here, but I'm going to put less trigger pressure down here. Less water pressure inside causes the stomates to close. That's because water is coming out of these cells, right? Or, or, or not enough going in, one or the other. And you can see that now there's no hole in between. So the plant doesn't need to decide or think about this. A lot of plant um, physiology is not due to a brain making decisions. It's due to responses to very simple things, but it produces some pretty cool behavior. So these stomates open and close automatically. Whenever the plant gets low on water, they automatically close. And whenever the plant has lots of water, they automatically open. Of course, the problem is, is you can't keep them closed forever because when you close the stomates, you also then begin to suffocate the plant. You also turn off the gas exchange. So it's kind of like a trade-off. The plant can afford to close the stomates in low water conditions for a while. But if you never water your plant and it dries and stays dry, well then it's also not photosynthesizing anymore because it can't get the carbon dioxide it needs and then the plant begins to die. So uh, the opening and closing of stomates is sort of a temporary water loss management system but eventually a plant like this has to be watered so the stomates can reopen and the gas can exchange. All right, there we go. There's the leaf. Any questions? So we'll stop there. Break. Well